Saturday, March 18, 1978. A perfect warm California spring day. A special day. A day of top to bottom, morning to night, sweet sounding, heart pounding, lookout world rock and roll. This is the day for California Jam 2. A constant stream of helicopters, vans, buses, shuttle back and forth carrying the stars and the workers. The fans pour in on foot, by car, by the tens of thousands. Together, they will make this day happen. Four years ago, Cal Jam 1 happened on this site. And now once more, inside the two and a half mile oval of Ontario Motor Speedway, a city has sprung up almost overnight. This is Cal Jam 2. 10 o'clock in the morning, and the hours, or weeks or months of anticipation, are about to come to an end. The largest sound system ever built for a concert stands ready to feed the hundreds of thousands of patiently waiting fans. Cal Jam 2 is underway. At this point here, we're probably looking at this city is about 250,000 people strong. This makes us the seventh largest city in the state of California, and it's our city. So let's take care of it. Let's keep this good spirit up. Donnie Branker is with me today. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, celebrating the uh, 30th anniversary of California Jam 2. Yeah, I did it when I was two years old, yeah. So. Yeah, no, you, you look exactly the same. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Mike, for having me here. appreciate it. You were sort of the mayor of that city, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. <laughs> well, mayor, chief of police, uh, fire chief, you, you everything. You did it all, yeah. yeah. Well, not all, and, and that's what I, I, I want to preface that. Cal Jam really is the work of three people, uh, myself, but it never would have happened without two people, Sandy Feldman, Lenny Stogel. Okay, we're going to play an interview with both of those fellas uh, that was conducted by uh, Jeff Conway, who uh, m many of you know from Taxi and more recently, rehab. the Rehab <laughs> Show. What kind of a crazy nutty person is going to take an undertaking like this? On? Well, I, I think you worded it very well, a crazy nutty kind of person that would go through something like this. But when you look at the event and you hear and all this excitement is here, it, it finally becomes worthwhile. Have you had any, like, really big problems on this, like with groups, talent? Yes. You mean in the last five minutes? <laughs> the last five minutes. <laughs> any groups yeah, cancel out yet? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Fortunately, the groups are, that's one advantage we have because of the nature of this event and the size of it and the caliber. They're all very happy to play here. Uh, we have the largest and best sound system ever for any concert. We have a fantastic stage. Uh, the stage set up with three different kinds of platforms so we can preset two other acts while one is performing. Uh, the acts are eager to come here, and of course we have the national attention, which, which doesn't hurt, because it is a very exciting moment of history. The last one was the largest grossing concert, and this one will break that record. It has broken it as of this morning. So this, these will be the two largest grossing concerts in history. I'm here with Lenny Stogel, the co-producer of the California Jam 2. Uh, Lenny, you did the first one, right? That's right. Now, um, how come you wanted to do a second one? Well, the first one was so successful that right after the first one, we wanted, we had planned to do a second one. It was just, took a lot of time to put it together. You know, it actually takes a year to put a jam together. That's, now, we're going to have, with this over 200,000 people, quarter of a million people here. Now, why do you think all those people come to something like this? It, well, this isn't really a, a rock concert. This is an event. This is going to be a historical event here today. We are going to have the largest single attendance at a, at a rock concert in history. And we're going to probably gross. They'll have the largest gross as well. Yeah, I keep on wondering, you know, that we had so much rain, 31 inches, I think. Uh, were you ever afraid that we were going to be rained out, swimming well, around in the mud? Well, I, I will tell you, you bet. <laughs> it rained for the last three Saturdays in a row. I didn't mind the fourth, you know, but we were just keeping our fingers crossed, watching those weather reports, yeah. and, well, you can see it's the most beautiful day we've had all year, and that's a good omen. Now, he mentions there that uh, there was a rain situation going on. It was the scariest thing in the whole world, to be honest with you. It had rained for like 40 or 50 days in a row <laughs> leading up to it. And as you know, on an outdoor show, there's only one thing that can destroy it, rain. Right. right. And I, I, I hate to say it, but the gods were looking upon us. That and we <laughs> called Dr. George from ABC Weather. Oh, of course, yeah. Who did a research and said on that day it had never rained in 55 years. Wow. And so I was going with Dr. George's uh, prediction. The rain stopped. 
It allowed us to do the show. It drizzled a little bit the day after, and then it started raining again. And why they allowed the skies to clear up for that show, uh, I'm surely grateful, but don't know why. Yeah, that's that's terrific. Let me see the list here. We had Dave Mason, Foreigner, Santana. Santana did an amazing set. Amazing. Well, he always does. Yeah. I mean, Carlos is fabulous. Yeah, and uh, Bob Welch, of course, opened the show. With, with Stevie Nicks with Steve. and Mick Fleetwood. Yeah, they came out and performed. Frank Marino and Mahogany Russian Rubicon. We'll get to that in a little bit. Heart, of course. Well, I mean, we were real lucky. I mean, here the, the top four acts on that show were um, Aerosmith, Nugent, Foreigner, and Heart. We booked the show in December. And by that time, by the time the show came around, four of the top five albums in the nation, in the world, were uh, Foreigner's first album, right. Hart's first album, uh, Nugent's uh, Cat Scratch Fever album, and Draw the Line from Aerosmith. So we really lucked into to that being so so hot at the time. So you, when you booked these act, they, uh, acts, they weren't as big as they ended up by the time the jam started. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, and of course, the jam made them even bigger than what they would have po- possibly wow. been. But uh, uh, back to Hart. Hart gave it one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. Uh, and, of course, the two girls were lovely then. They still are. But, uh, I mean, I, I was just... I And I... I do apologize for one thing. I had to cut Hart's encore, as you know. I, ha- uh, you oh, I didn't know. know that. I had the kids climbing the light towers, mm. and so I waited till they 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 hit the last note of the song, and they deserved another encore. Believe me, and, and girls, I'm still sorry about it, but <laughs> I had to get out there and boo the guys down from the light towers because the light towers had those big. Um, uh, 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 lights on them. Sure. They weigh about a ton each, and there's six on each tower. Yeah, you don't want those coming down. You don't want those coming down, yeah. and and they probably still hate me for it, but I had to do it for the safety of everybody. But I never saw a better performance than Hearts that night. Now, what we're going to play now is an interview I did about 10 years ago with Ted Nugent, and uh, we talked about the California Jam. And, uh, again, like the Sabbath situation at Cal Jam 1, right before Nugent came on, You had some issues with, uh, I think, a fence again. Oh, yeah. Front people here. It's very, very important. I don't want anyone getting hurt here. We got this far. Let's go. We got the the second half of the show still to come, and we're going to get through it together. So we got lots of room over on this side, and that's where the pressure is coming from. It takes all of you for it to work. Everybody moves back. We can get it done, and I can get off the stage here, and we'll get Mr. Nugent. California Jam 2. I thought it was a stunning performance. Mr. Ted Nugent. But that was not a fun day for you. I had literally escaped the Sudan, Africa, with my life. Merely 48 hours prior to putting my guitar over my head. I had run with the Maasai and the Watusi warriors as the rebels were taking over uh, the epicenters of humanity, the Sudan, and killing white people. I barely commandeered a Red Cross plane to get me out of the Sudan from Kapweta, deep in the bowels of Mother Africa, to Cairo. I, uh, being the aggressive, assertive, motor city mad son of a bitch that I am, I was able to uh, find my way from Cairo to uh, London by way of a transport plane, mm-hmm. um, force my way on a uh, uh, one of those big uh, supersonic jets, the uh, what do they call the Concorde, land at Kennedy where they reserved a on the tarmac. I I just I deplaned on the tarmac at Kennedy where they had held up a TWA flight to get me to LAX. I landed and was helicoptered from the tarmac, tarmac at LAX to the uh, uh, Ontario Speedway. Fifteen minutes before I was supposed to go on stage, not having seen a shower or a bed or clean sheets or any moment of rest in like 72 hours i ran hundreds of miles with the maasai to find my way out of the sudan uh during the early rains a very a life and death situation plus i came home to the notice that my wife had filed for divorce that moment and that the band was quitting after that performance so (laughs) i mean life is an adventure damn it uh, it, that's okay, but you noticed my performance wasn't lackluster, was it? Uh, you wouldn't have known. That's what was amazing about it. It was on fire because my music is the cure-all. My guitar delivers the the cure. It is the great um, uh, equalizer. Uh, and when I get on stage, uh, it just doesn't matter. I played for that half million people and I played 
rather valiantly if I do say so myself. Those were flames coming out of both my eyes, my my mouth, and there was a few coming out of my ass that night. Hey! 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 California! Honey, how you doing out there, man? You're doing all right! You're doing all right! You're doing all right! I can't chase it away. I can't chase it away. I got it so good. I got it so good, man. I'll tell you what we got here before our very eyes. It's on a swim my size. It's a free for all, baby. We just grabbed crazy man Gonzo Ted Nugent off the yeah. stage, and we've got a few things we want to ask him. Rumor has you got the answer. You got the questions. I got. The okay. First thing, what do you think of California Jam 2? I don't have to think about it, man. It's beyond. It's Gonzolitis, man. This is great. It's rock and roll. It's nonstop boogie woogie. I don't got to think. I know. I can look and see it right there. It's great. Perfect. Hey, you got like incredible control over your audience. I mean, uh, people start getting crazy. Right. In fact, my sister was thrown off the stage. It's good for. It's good for. It's good. <laughs> Gonzo. Man, I so, I mean, like, how do you feel about having control of a quarter million people? Uh, it's not a matter of me having the control. It's the rock and roll is, like, overseeing the whole thing, you know what I mean? And I'm just kind of m manipulating the rock and roll. Therefore, I've basically got the power in the midst of my hands. But it's everybody's, you know, and I'm just up there manipulating the mess. Well, did you kind of pr provoke them into no, the, no, the audience? No, they provoke me. They provoke me. They're responsible. I'm not. I'm just, I'm just reacting to their demands, you know. And my demands, I, I'm my own biggest fan, you know. If I wasn't playing, I'd go see me, you know. I'd, like, I'd go see rock and roll if I wasn't a rock and roller because I I dig it, you know? It's a good, clean fun. It's a riot. I dig it. I have been dying to know what turns you on the most when you perform. Your legs. <laughs> <laughs> You'd say the nicest thing. That's true. No, it's true. Another thing I was curious is you're one of the, I would say you're one of Rock's most physical performers. What do you do after you get off stage? Do you just totally collapse or do you go boogieing right on down? <laughs> Your legs. No, I just, uh, tonight I'm going to bed. I'm going to sleep. I've been, up, I've been up for too many days. But when I'm done rock and roll, see, I can only stay on stage so long. And by the time it's time for me to get off stage, I'm just kind of getting lubricated, you know? So I really wish I could play longer. But as the world turns, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, you uh, kind of demand a lot on yourself to make it tough. What, what do you want from an audience? Everything. Maximum. More than they got. You want their t-shirts? I want everything. <laughs> I, want, I want everything, you know. I want, I want total involvement. I want everybody to go to the peak and beyond, you know, because this is a good opportunity for everybody to sweat and live it up and jump up and down, scream and shout and boogie woogie and go crazy. This is perfect, you know, perfect release. And I want everybody to participate with everything they can possibly muster. Donnie is about to tell me a story I didn't know about uh, the Aerosmith participation in Cal Jam 2. You're well, on. All right, real quickly, here's a story. And I know the fans out there have heard all these um, contract stories, but here's the God's truth of a story that happened that changed my life. Um, when you hire a band, you, the first page is how much money you're going to pay them and what percentage. And then they have what they call a rider. And the rider can be anywhere from five pages to 50 pages of contractual obligations that have to do with technical requirements, sound requirements, right. lighting, staging, and food. And within each, each band has certain food requirements that we have caterers that have to deal with it. Right. They call them riders. Riders. Right? They're, yeah. yeah, they're contract riders. And, in, in, uh, and we had a person who was very qualified, done hundreds of shows with me, and she was in, to, to comply with that. Because the bands, the least they, they could have is what they want. Sure. Now the demands are, are horrendous. Like J-Lo, I think, makes you paint the walls fresh white or something. and they, they really get ridiculous. They're obscene. It's all ego. But anyway, here's in, in, in the Aerosmith writer, there was one thing that said uh, two pounds of jelly beans and no black jelly beans. To be honest with you, I didn't see it because that's, that's really not my job to take care of. Nugent, uh, I'm sorry, um, Foreigner goes off the stage after a fabulous show, by the way. Sure, and and uh, their album was top uh, in the top five at the right. time, Foreigner's first album. And um, I'm waiting for Aerosmith to really finish the show. That complies that our two headliners, Nugent and Aerosmith, have to play. Otherwise, I have to refund the money. Right. Because my headline, it's, it's kind of my contract with the audience. I get a, a call in the walkie-talkie saying, Donnie, we need you at Earl Smith's uh, dressing room. We have a problem. And those are not words that anybody wants to hear. So I went over uh, to where their dressing room was, which is uh, in the infield part of the uh, 
they were trailers that we had set up for them. Right. And Ann is uh, Lieber and Krebs at the time, who were Errol Smith's managers, also a Nugent's manager, by the way, at the same time. My dear friend Tom Ross from Creative Artist uh, b- booked both of them, and he's the one that put the show together for us. And um, anyway, I walk in the dressing room, Lieber and Krebs say, Donnie, we got a problem. The band's not going to play. I go, why? <laughs> and they said, well, because you broke our contract with us. Uh, the girl forgot to take the black jelly beans out of the two pounds of jelly beans. And, and of course, I'm sitting there with, abs- I've been up for four days, you know, it's, it's, you know, these things are, a, are an ordeal to put on, and all I need to do is have one more band play, you know. Yeah, you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing light at the end of the tunnel, man. Period. Yeah. I see the light, and all I have to do is get them on stage, right? Right. That's it. And, and so my, whole, my heart stopped beating, and literally, and then in walks Steve Tyler. I'd never seen him before, and he's got all these silk handkerchiefs on, and all I really saw was silk handkerchiefs and a big mouth, you know. And uh, he, he walks in and goes, we're not playing. And I said, and why aren't you going to play? Because you broke your contract, you know. And we had already paid him the quarter million dollars, which was their guarantee, and they were going to get a piece later on. And I said, so let me understand this. I have 350,000 people out there, and you're not going to play because somebody forgot to take out black jelly beans. He goes, you got it. And I thought to myself, and I said, and I was pretty tired at the time. I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk from this dressing room to the stage. If your band is not on the stage, I will walk up there. I will I will tell the audience you're not going to play because of black jelly beans. I will pack my wife up in the car, and I'll watch the riot on the uh, 10 o'clock news tonight. I said, because this is just ridiculous. And I walked out, slammed the door, and I'm walking all by myself, pure pitch black in the infield there of uh, Ontario Speedway. And I walked to the bottom of the stage wondering, well, now what are you going to do, big boy? <laughs> <laughs> is this the bluff of all bluffs? Uh, you know, are you <laughs> it, it, it sounded good on paper, didn't it? Yeah. Well, it sounded good when I said it. Uh, but anyway, and the next thing, I, I did hear, I started to hear a pitter-patter of the feet on the blacktop, you know. And I realized, and I waited at the bottom of the stairs, and the band went running up on stage. And the conversation that went on with uh, Steve and, and Lieber and Cribs afterwards was, is this guy bluffing? And Lieber Krebs said, we've known him for 10 years. He'll do it. Uh, he said, "He, you don't know him. He'll do it. Like this. Anyway, they ran on stage. I walked up the stairs after them very politely, ladies and gentlemen, Aerosmith. And they put on one great show. But here, here's the significance to it. It changed my life because after I announced him on, I went to my trailer. And I thought, is this really what rock and roll has come down to? where the, the, the band is more important than the audiences mm-hmm. out there. And as time went on, that came to be a proven fact. You know, right. the corporate got in there and, and bands. But there, those of you who were at the jam, um, if they had not played, um, the, the ramifications of that pro- possibly could have been hundreds dead, thousands hurt. Uh, it would have been the biggest nightmare in the history of rock and roll. And um, thank goodness um, they took my bluff and, and they played and it was all gone. But... If that would is that what rock and roll had come to literally drove me out of the business because I knew the fun was gone and yeah. and it was and it is it's yeah. not fun anymore it's yeah. business. So Aerosmith finished up. You had one act after that, right? Yeah. Here's here was where our planning. We we knew we were going to have somewhere between two hundred fifty and three hundred fifty thousand people. The only way to leave the infield of Ontario Motor Speedway is through two underground tunnels that went underneath the speedway right. itself. Period. So we thought that we would put uh, a band on after Aerosmith so the audience would start saying to watch them. And through natural attrition, they would orderly go to their cars. Right. Uh, and uh, Did and that work? It sure did. And, and, and it re- wasn't a really fair thing to do with Rubicon, but they were new at the time. Sure. Nobody really knew who That's they were. Right. It was a what a break for a new band, yeah. in a way, you know, yeah. really. Well, and you know, and some of them were old buddies from Cold Blood, which I did, worked with Liddy right. and Cold Blood many times and, and with... Um, Sly and the Family Sly Stone. Sly and the Family Stone, yeah. and, and, and they're great musicians, and, and a great band they really were. It was a favorite of Columbia Records. that They had just brought out the sure. new album there. Right. And they did. They orderly dispersed the crowd, and they left in an orderly fashion, those that could leave. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and the show was, as they call it, the most perfect show ever held. Your first band, Rubicon. Rubicon, yes, that was... That was I like, quit. Any chance of a reunion of that? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. Well, there's a band where I don't now, know. I saw guys... I saw that band. You're joking. California Jam too. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we we did play there. You were kind of the headliners yeah. there. Yeah, we closed the show. Right. Close. We were close. There's only about ten thousand people there walking away when we played or something. <laughs> but it was a wild. Uh, Rubicon was a fun band. That was. 
I, I was a pre-med student in college in San Diego, and I, at San Diego State, and I quit in my fourth year to move to San Francisco to join a rock band. That was Rubicon. So that band sort of started me up, you know, in, in the Bay Area, as, as it were, you know. And, and actually, Brad Gillis, the guitarist from Night Ranger, was, was also in Rubicon. And Kelly Keggy, the drummer for Night Ranger, was the last touring drummer of the band. He joined the band in 1979, played one tour with us. Kind of a different sound than what Night Ranger uh, oh, evolved yeah. into. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it had <laughs> nothing to do. It was like a funk horn band. Right, right. We were a bunch of, um, you know, uh, black guys trapped in a bunch of white men's bodies. <laughs> Had you met Ted at that point? Because he played that show, too, the California Jam, too. And, I, and Aerosmith was on that bill as well, Isn't right? that funny? Now they're all my friends. Yeah. Well, that is wild. And here I am, I was in a band with Ted, and, and now I'm on albums with Aerosmith with songs. That's right. pretty funny. I remember Cal Jam, too. He told me he had fired his band when he walked off stage from that gig because they were being such jerks to him. They were being such a little size. So he fired the band. And the minute he walked off stage, and I remember because our dressing room was next to Ted's, our trailer, and Ted pushed both of his hands through the wall of the trailer. Just sl- He was so pissed. He was so mad at these guys. And, so he, and he just broke the window and smashed his both hands through the wall. And I, we remember that going, oh, Ted Nugent just smashed his hands through the wall. Oh, you know, he was right funny. next to us and everything like that. And here, here I was, you know, like 50 years later in a band with him or something that's very well the, the, that's that's interesting i hadn't heard that part but i had heard that he had come to that gig directly from an african from saf- africa yeah from an african safari that's right yeah so he was probably a little amped anyway a little amped and a little uh, jet lagged yeah. <laughs> a little cranky <laughs> a little cranky <laughs> just a little cranky i want to take just a couple of seconds here and thank you so so much donnie for coming down and uh, uh, participating in this anniversary show. Well, really, thank you for having me. Uh, this is uh, this has been uh, this has been a dream of mine to do something like this in a, for a long time, and and you are the reason we have been able to put this together. And I I truly truly appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate you and all the people who still remember the good work that we did. It's been a good day. It's been a long day. We thank you. Exits, as you well know, is. Over here to your left of the west parking lot, behind you, east parking lot. We've run past our curfew. Good night. Drive careful home.